Good evening, everybody, and welcome. My name is Avi, and I help run events here at the Strand. Before we launch into the discussion of Hannah Stevens' new book, The Distance Cure, I would like to share a little bit of history about the Strand. The Strand was founded in 1927 by Benjamin Bass on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Switching from Union Square to Asa Place, Book Row gradually dwindled from 48 bookstores until after 94 years, the Strand is the sole survivor, now run by third generation owner, Nancy Bass Wyden. We want to thank all of you for your support. With our loyal community of book lovers and authors, we wouldn't be here today. Tonight, we're thrilled to have with us Hannah Steven for the launch of her new book, The Distance Cure, A History of Teletherapy. Hannah Steven is, teaches at UC Berkeley in the departments of English and History. Steven is also at work on her second book, Mother's Little Helpers, Technology in the American Family. Other writing has appeared or is forthcoming from The Washington Post, Logic Magazine, The Set, Slate, Public Books, The Los Angeles Reviews of Books, Real Life Magazine, and beyond. Joining Hannah in conversation tonight is Grace Slavery. Grace Slavery is an associate professor in the Department of English at UC Berkeley and general editor at, of Transgender Studies at Quarterly. She is the author of Quaint, Exquisite, Victorian Aesthetics, and The Idea of Japan, which won the NAFSA Best Book of the Year Prize and of Please Miss, an experimental memoir which will be published by Seal Press. Her essays have appeared in Critical Inquiry, Foreign Policy, Differences, a Journal of Feminist Cultural Studies, English Literary History, and elsewhere. She also writes a newsletter, The Wasex Review. She is currently completing two books, Modern Trans Feminist Rhetorics of Technique, and one of the problem of narrative closure in the age of sitcom. So without further ado, please show me in welcoming Hannah Steven, and Grace Lavery. I cannot tell you how excited I am to have been asked to ask you questions today, Hannah. Thank you so much for asking me questions, and I can't wait to see you soon out here. I know, it's true. I, I am flying out to California tomorrow for the first time in 18 months, um, and I'm very much looking forward to it. Hannah, there's a delay on the sound. I'm so sorry about this. I'm going to take my ear pods out in the hope that that um, solves this problem. Just give me one second. Of course. We're just enacting some of the problems with gathering over distance before we talk about gathering over distance. You know, and it's perfect, isn't it? Because um, you've written this beautiful book concerned with mediation and you know, I think the affirmative possibilities of mediation or, or actually, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a critique of mediation and of technology here, but there's also, I think, a refusal to, um, to take easy answers or, or offer an easy polarization between mediated and unmediated forms of therapy, which um, I know has been really important to me as I work through this. You know, I'm, I'm not going to assume that everyone here has had a chance to read this work yet, so I'm just going to begin by asking you to T tell us the tell us the argument tell us the story of this book thank you so much grace yeah so the book uh takes as its central concern the history of teletherapy uh from 1890 to you know last summer uh when i stopped writing the book um and there uh, the first thing i had to do to write accurately i felt about relating over distance in therapy, but of course the book is an aperture onto all the forms of relating we do at distance. I had to um, think about what it what it's comprised of. And the first revision I make is that we never just meet in dyads of therapist and clinic uh, and patient, but there's always media. Um, so that's the first argument. And there, from there, I look at what it means to do that work uh, under a, the sign of what I call distanced intimacy both the violence of intimacy and its, uh, its clinical effect. Uh, so we look at Freud and then uh, the radio, all the way from Winnicott to Esther Perel on podcasts, suicide hotlines, uh, e-therapy mm -hmm. from early internet to things like better help in talk space, and then ending with this elusive quest to find an AI therapist. Yeah. Which, which you write about with such um, excitement, I think. But the excitement seems directed as much at the at the question and the philosophical problem that the AI therapist would pose as about the possibility that we could heal ourselves using robots. Yeah, it, it, it seems like nonetheless. 
Yeah. Um, I love the idea of healing ourselves with robots, though. I mean, it, it's, it seems so uh, useful. I mean, I think one of the things that this book does is it puts psychoanalysis and the Turing test in sort of necessary conversation with each other as ways of thinking about interpretation and bi bilateral modes of getting to know, modes of paying attention. Um, there's so many questions I want to ask you about this, Hannah. And I think the first one that, that occurs to me, um, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but um, you, the title that you've given us is The Distance Cure, A History of Teletherapy. Um, but there are various moments in this book where it seems as though you're dodging away from cure as the, as the goal of therapy. Um, and I'd, I'd be fascinated to hear you talk more about what place cure has in psychoanalysis for you. Um, and then perhaps there's a broader historical question afterwards, but I think I'll just start with that. Well, what is psychoanalysis if not cure? Um, I think it's, it's more, well, of course. So the first thing to say is that many psychoanalysts for a very long time would think about cure, uh, would think about hopefully that termination would come not from calling it quits, but because some kind of curative function had been arrived at. And that's especially true when psychoanalysis is really medicalized and part of, you know, the larger, um, yeah, discipline like psychiatry, especially in this country. That's not a universal, um, but that is very particular mm -hmm. to the US. Um, so that could look like many things, something resolved, some kind of, um, ending or giving up of whatever the, the symptom is, the presenting complaint is resolved as a kind of cure. Uh, that would look very different depending on the kind of patient and what that presenting complaint might be. Um, one thing I was thrilled to discover in looking at the history of teletherapy is that it's much more about a kind of contingent help uh, than uh, ever a long-term solution that would lead to the question of cure, which is something, of course, I don't believe in. Um, these are not, or these things are not gonna be what quote unquote cures us. And coming from disability studies as well as I refuse the framework of, of cure, which I try and make clear in the introduction, but nonetheless, coming from the talking cure, there is something about relating over distance that is integral to how all of these different actors think about the practice that they're undertaking and that distance is a necessary ingredient, either because they won't go to therapy otherwise or wouldn't offer therapy otherwise, or because they can't meet in person just as right now, of course, none of us are, are still doing. Um, COVID-19 was not the first time meeting together was impossible for reasons material or otherwise. No, and you know, the first historical moment of this book is not the, the, the coronavirus, but the election of Donald Trump in 2016. Um, and I was really struck by your opening with a moment of, um, suicide hotlines being, um, you know, overburdened, which is a slightly loaded word, by, um, by people who are experiencing intense suicidal feelings and intense suicidality for, for the first time, or at least in a particular crisis. Um, you know, th that's part of the question that I was going to get to with this historical narrative, I think, which is one of the things that I think you're doing by emphasizing this um, sort of um, contingent intervention, psychoanalysis is a contingent intervention into a particular set of circumstances, is to draw psychoanalysis closer than it usually is thought of to the suicide hotline. Um, and I'd love to hear more about that connection for you. We usually think of these, or at least I have, I have until I read your book, tended to think of these as fundamentally distinct kinds of practice, but I think you, you persuaded me that actually they have, have a great deal in common. Thank you for this question. Yeah, I think first of all, so on the one hand, we do definitely think of these practices as distinct, even if we could yoke them under the sign of some kind of help. Uh, but one is therapy and the other, maybe we might think of as not, but something else, crisis intervention, which is maybe discreet. When I started doing the research for the suicide hotline chapter, 
a number of things happened. First of all is that if I had had to guess before looking into it, the suicide hotline was a lot older than I thought it was, the 1950s at least. Mm -hmm. um, second of all, that it actually was deeply interested in psychoanalysis uh, and psychotherapy, but comes out of a pastoral tradition, a Christian tradition, an Anglican tradition. Um, and then in the US gets immediately queered here in the Bay Area. Uh, the first operant suicide hotline was run by an Anglican priest who is gay and was interested in doing a kind of double outreach work to the suicidal and to the LGBT community in the Tenderloin and beyond in San Francisco. Um, but all of these folks were very invested in thinking through questions of listening that nearly are identical to what Freud had posited. And part of that was historical. They were trained by these uh, groups who brought together Norman Vis Vincent Peale, Pull Yourself Up by Your Bootstraps, Americana, Religiosity, and Smiley Blanton, who mm -hmm. I think I'm gonna just try and mention in each event I do, just for his name, but Smiley Blanton, who was a New York psychoanalyst and a patient of Freud's. And the two of them made this very specific kind of psycho-religious counseling um, that then suffused the hotline. Even as we've moved further away from that, uh, model, that's where it started. And I think we still have echoes of that in the present. It's it's an especially good name because you and I have a colleague named Blanton who is not an especially smiley person. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps you were not trying to re reference that. Um, no, I mean, this is, this is so fascinating. I'm thinking too, the history that you're drawing on here. Sorry? I said, you have tenure. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that's right, yeah. Um, yeah that's a very, a, a very good point. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't intended as a criticism. But so, no, the, um, the, the, the connection that you're drawing between the kind of religious post-war groups pushes me in two different sort of directions or spins two different trains of imaginative thinking. On the one hand, one thinks about the telephone as this um, strange moment of intervention. Uh, I'm thinking of that scene in Mad Men when Don Draper gets on the phone to Betty's analyst and we realize that he has been reporting everything that's been happening in session to his patient's husband. And the notion of the, of the phone as a sort of a conspiratorial vehicle that you know, itself seems to kind of activate feelings and thoughts around um, the feminine mystique and the kind of the housewife as the American housewife in the 1950s is a peculiar kind of analytic subject. Um, but then on the other hand, sort of emerging Cold War cosmology organized around the telephone is this kind of vehicle of um, geopolitical and ontological terror. Um, but the other thing that, that, that is called to my mind with this history that you're deriving is AA, the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, yeah. which is itself a sort of synthesized um, project between sort of like unusual evangelical Christians or unusual, unusual evangelists, um, some kind of psychoanalytic investment that comes mostly seemingly through Jung, but clearly through other means too, not all of which are uh, widely e easy to figure out. Um, and then this other aspect of kind of technology as being um, one of the vehicles for, um, you know, not, not therapy, but mutual aid and mutual support. So you can, you can call someone when, um, when, when things are getting difficult, your goal is to call someone. The telephone becomes such a privileged vehicle in AA for a lot of, you know, a lot of different situations. Yeah, I think that AA, which appears it appears in that suicide hotline chapter a little bit, but then again, in the there is a coda on the pandemic. So it's funny you you reference the Trump election. I didn't know whether or not Trump was going to be elected to another term when I had to turn in my book by like a week. So there's a, it's very pointedly says in the 2016 right like I couldn't I had to like guess um and make make an opening there but aa comes up again because of the massive amounts of zoom bombing that started to happen in the transition to aa online and al-anon uh, online yeah. uh, 
the COVID pandemic at the very beginning. I think that's largely we've figured out various protocols. But AA is fascinating because there are all, all these forms of media there. There's the mediation of the group and the group being really important, but also the book and having a kind of uh, set of steps, prayer, right, which is uh, running throughout uh, like many sort of American media projects is a sort of quiet form, uh, maybe in parallel with telepathy throughout the whole book. What is prayer and what is telepathy, if not a form of teletherapy? Um, but then, of course, with A is your point. We'll get there. I promise we'll get to telepathy. <laughs> but, but there also becomes this form, right, of outreach. Uh, in AA and and not only keeping members in, but then the dyads that break out of the larger group. And the hotline is very close in a way. It's just only at distance. There's no convening of the group. Um, and it's also carried under, really importantly, that sign of anonymity. So it, it is really a remediation of both the confessional on the one hand and also the kind of work of AA, where you are allowed to speak without giving your full name, and you're supposed to be allowed to speak without giving your geography, um, which is really changed in the contemporary. Hotlines frequently do uh, know where you are and are collecting all kinds of data, either by hand or um, you know by using sort of crawling and machine learning. And that has a really, um, intense shift to what was originally very important to the more radical hotlines, right? Which was to never take that in, precisely because of suicide status as a crime. And also because, you know, hotlines were carved out away from psychiatry, precisely because they were homophobic, you know, because they were racist psychiatrists. And the hotline was supposed to be a space outside yeah. of and liminal from that, however successfully. Mm -hmm. So this leads to a sort of theoretical question that I've been mulling over, which is, do we think that the subject of psychoanalysis, the patient in the classical psychoanalytic scene is anonymous or not, um, in the same way that a person on the other end of the phone is anonymous? We could imagine limitations of that kind of anonymity that wouldn't apply under other circumstances. So, for example, um, if someone... Uh, acknowledged an intention to commit a violent crime that would have an implication in a clinical scene that presumably wouldn't be viable in a, in a, in a suicide hotline. But also, um, we know that AA meetings and AA groups are not privileged speech within the framework of you know, federal law. Um, so to that extent, anything that you tell your sponsor um, they, they may be required to repeat in court. Um, obviously, the, the legal framework is not the primary way in which AA wants to think about anonymity, but um, it was interesting to me because I tend to think of, I mean, again, as you've rightly pointed out, for too long we have all tended to think of psychoanalysis as a bilateral relation between two individuals who must in some way undergo a transformative process of shedding individuality and then being sort of re refilled with it in some way. Um, and what you're doing by introducing mediation into that kind of scene is showing that there are always more people in the room, but there are, it's never just the two. Um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts about this, but do, do, you, do you think that anonymity is a useful concept for psychoanalysis? God, I love this question, Grace. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there are all these ways we try and pretend in a way that you're able to, you know, the rituals of coming together uh, for psycho psychoanalytic meetings and coming apart between patient and analyst are very much about protecting one-sided pseudo-anonymity, right? The clinician is not supposed to be Googleable is not supposed to be on Twitter. I mean, millennial and Gen Z therapists are going to have changed all of this, obviously. But this is the classic scenario, and also yeah, that we're not supposed. They have already. To, they have. I mean, yeah, increasingly, um, and that the patient also is supposed to be taken at their word in a way in the room. So you're not supposed to have extra textuals. Um, I think that was one thing that Zoom really disrupted was that you were seeing into the patient's mm -hmm. home. You were seeing into maybe the analyst's home. Uh, and that was uh, a difference to the original scenario mediated 
already as it were, but this is an additional and specific mediation. Um, so yes, I mean, we, we all know that we, it's not actually just two people coming together because it's never only just two people, um, right? The, then what is fantasy? What is transference? What is counter-transference? Um, but I, I do think it'd be wild to think about a kind of, not full anonymity, but pseudo-anonymous encounter in the analytic scenario. I mean, but then what about money? I, money is always my first litmus test for, for that question. Um, long before we had Venmo for psychoanalysis and therapy more generally, right? The check or cash, which is more anonymous. Um, what about the office, the office in someone's home or backyard? In California, very popular. Um, in England, very popular, less popular in New York and so on. Um, so maybe just more one-sided and still only pseudo. So the, the, the conversation about uh, mediation and, and media as what as in what are, what are the plural of medium? What are the mediums? What are the media through which analysis does its work? It's such a complicated one um, that you've really uh, addressed directly here. Um, you, you very early on say that money is a medium in a sense, um, but it's a it's a medium in a, in a different kind of sense, or in a sort of more extra diegetic or meta diegetic sense than would be say language. Um, I've always understood uh, the media of psychoanalysis in the kind of basic sense to be time, language, and money, and some kind of exchange between them. Although I think you've added uh, at least one more to that, being the kind of um, community, the, the possibility for the community relation between uh, transference. The, 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 the community possibility for a transference or transferential relationship or something like that. Um, but I'd love to hear a little more about money and whether or not you think money, um, whether or not you think money can um, be dispensed with for the psychoanalytic scene. This is one of the questions that is raised by the AI um, analysts: is that we will uh, get free therapy, presumably, and maybe we would we would have therapy on the on the strength of other costs. I was thinking often as I was reading this, um, and this is something that I've thought of as a as a, as a teacher during the, the COVID crisis is that for many years, I and a number of other people, I think, but certainly me have been terrified that they were eventually, they meaning capital, was eventually going to shuffle us all online because the purpose of capital uh, is to prevent its workers from talking to each other because when workers talk to each other, they establish shared interests or they shared, establish shared interests they establish bargaining units and then, you know, all hell breaks loose from Capital's perspective. And um, I, I, I've found myself uh, concerned about that for some years. But then it turns out that, at least in the short term, we don't need to worry about that quite so much because the costs of Zoom education from the university's perspective have been much higher than I think at least I expected. And I think any of us were really expected. Um, they haven't been able to reduce been able to reduce tuition fees because, um, in fact, the cost of instruction from the university's perspective has gone up, um, given the cost of the various different um, infrastructural issues relating to servers, relating to bandwidth, relating to making sure that everyone has the adequate and appropriate technology. So there's some way in which a, making things virtual obscures or defers costs but actually doesn't necessarily decrease them. Yes. Um, but nonetheless, um, nonetheless, uh, you and I can probably imagine some future um, where for three bucks we can download to our iPhone, which of course cost us several hundred dollars um, at least. Uh, we can download to our iPhone a three dollar app that will ask us, how did that make you feel? What do you say we have a feel? Um, and how did that make you feel? How did that make you feel? Some version of that. With ever more sophistication. Well, I think the um, difference... Yeah, I think go. the difference between 
so I mean, I too, like I think many academics, uh, March 2020 was like, this is the end. And now we'll all be online and they'll reuse the same material. And we've seen that. I have a, a mm -hmm. colleague, Tamara Kanis, who works on, um, you know, life after death in the digital. And there have been times where dead faculty's videos are being used to teach students. Uh, and she is an amazing scholar and everyone should check out her work. Um, and though that's happening, of course, the college experience in the US has been sold as one of dorm rooms, quads, uh, parties, and instruction. Um, so, you know, there's huge investment in those infrastructures of embodied togetherness. Uh, I think what happened in COVID-19 mm -hmm. for therapy, it was somewhat different, which is that it, it worked for a lot of people who already had access to Zoom, right, which costs something. Like you're saying, the phone, the internet, not everyone has access to these things. Um, and uh, sometimes it's exhausting, sometimes it's, uh, I think maybe especially for, for clinicians, uh, but that it works, like the work can happen there, hosted there. Um, the apps already exist, you know, uh, unfortunately, like my phone is still filled with them from writing this book. I should probably delete them. Um, whether they're supposed to listen to your voice using some kind of uh, paralinguistic vocal monitoring and tell you, Hannah, you sound, you know, happy today. You sound sad today. Uh, you sound angry today. Maybe you should take a walk, right? They always, these nudging and suggestions. Amazon has one called Halo. It's always trying to make you more polite and kind because of course no one should ever be angry about anything and so on. So that reality is here, but really they're no better than 1966 where it can say, can you tell me more about that? Can you tell me more about that? And people do enjoy it, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the problem is of course that in this broken world, that might be all someone can a access on 10 levels uh, not just in terms of digital access, but also financially take the time for. Um, and I don't think we can also still call it uh, um, therapeutic help, not in the traditional sense. It's doing something yeah. else. Yeah. Something like more like self-help or what I call I mean, the book auto intimacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, maybe what you're showing, though, is that that dimension of remote intimacy or that of distant intimacy um, is already implied within psychoanalysis in some way. It's actually not. Um, it may be different in certain ways, but that, that wouldn't be the, the vector of difference, actually. Then. Um, once we have denuded psychoanalysis of its fantastical um, and, you know, quasi-authoritarian goals, which is we are going to transform you into productive workers um, or, or whatever, whatever it is. We are going to acclimate you to, you know, the disgusting humiliations of patriarchy, whatever you might imagine to be the authoritarian goals of psychoanalysis. Once we get rid of those, what we might be left with is something a little bit more like a kind of distant intimacy. Yeah, and it was also already there in that form too. Um, you know, or this is mm -hmm. this is the argument. It's just the minute, you know, something like the minute Freud stopped laying hands on his patients, because as rest in peace, Janet Malcolm tells us he wasn't very good at it. Um, I think that might be a direct mm -hmm. quote. Uh, you know, some some intervening distance had to take place. And then the question is, is the distance the six feet between the couch and the chair? Is it the distance and intimacy that's implied by groups and group therapy and group functioning? All of these are embodied in-person scenarios. Or is it the, you know, extra intimacy of both being in noise canceling headphones you know, where it's a different kind of audio intimacy and who's to say that that's actually further away, um, except that two bodies aren't in the same it room. It can feel inside the head. But you're inside your head but instead. it feels inside the head. Yes. Um, yeah. and, and actually might be too close for comfort. So I think one thing you, you started by saying, and I really appreciate that, that it's not, the book is not interested in a moral panic. That's true. Nor is it just like, 
happily in favor of every single form of teletherapy. It's certainly not. Um, this is late stage capital after all, but that there is something to think about where actually the goal might not just be about more intimacy. And when I started the book, much of the discourse around teletherapy was that it was hopelessly lesser precisely because it was distant to the point of conflating absence and distance, mm -hmm. uh, which is something I really tried to underscore mm -hmm. in the book not being so. No, I mean, you know, it, it will sound so banal to you, I suspect, but I, I really feel echoes of some of my own thoughts about um, aesthetics and the ways in which what is furthest away can sometimes feel most intimately important in a deeply embodied sense. Um, but the question, but this is going to bring me right back round to the other, to the final form of the historical question that I had before, which is that um, there are various forms of relativization that you're performing in this book and in this conversation where you're uh, diminishing the uniqueness of psychoanalysis in relation to other forms of listening or conversation. That's part of it. Um, you're chipping away, and I think rightly, at the um, singularity, decisiveness of the moment of termination and analysis. Um, and what we see in psychoanalysis, I mean, you're also chipping away at cure, uh, partly on the political grounds that you mentioned with reference to, uh, you know, with reference to disability studies. But my question is, what is left? What was psychoanalysis then? What, what, how do we actually think about it as something that emerged roughly in historical time, time around 1890? Is, is, is psychoanalysis first and foremost a technological development that has to do with the possibility of remote intimacy? Is that, um, is that, is that what it is? And if so, is it, you know, how do we think of it in relation to other forms of um, remote intimacy, like for instance, the cinema, which sort of we think of as a possibility for something else that you know, is roughly sort of, um, you know, roughly contemporaneous in some ways. Um, it, you know, what is psychoanalysis if not, um, you know, a, a, some diminished form of a cure or some, some diminished form of, of, of medicine? Yeah, no, I, so I think you can, you can bracket or do away with or undermine the notion of cure and preserve the clinical, um, right? That there can be something, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I like cinema, not cinema, and floating up in the chat or Bonbon, bon, of course, Grace's dog, who's a little bit sometimes behind mm -hmm. There, there, Aww. there have been, there's been, you know, 130 years of, um, of that practice that have, for some people has been wildly disappointing for others. It's been the life savior that allows them to go on. Um, you know, you raised it or hinted at it. Freud's adage, of course, is, you know, it's the thing that will allow you to love and to work. So of course it comes from its moment uh, in capital. Uh, I think that second question is gonna be a really important one uh, that I'd love to see more uh, dealt with. Like what is it if, we, if it's not preparing us for a fitness for work? Um, what about love and something else? Um, and I, but, and of course, you know, that's the Hitler argument is that psychoanalysis emerges alongside these, these other, you know, discourse networks. Um, but for me, it's not to say, so it's just that it's definitely still a clinical forum, but right away. And only the first two chapters of the book are really properly and not even the whole second chapter about psychoanalysis itself. Um, but to say it's contiguous with these other forms of care and help, including in their problems. You know, I think too frequently um, care is just kind of bandied about as this like happy, good thing that we all need instead of also quite frequently a way that violence is carried. Um, and the minute you pause to think about mm -hmm. it, of course, you're like, yes, <laughs> care is often a medium for violence, not only. Um, so yeah, I mean, the very first instance with Freud, uh, psychoanalysis is a friendship. You know, it, it's that, you know, relationship that's first and foremost. I think it changes across time. And now, of course, this is a real question too, facing psychoanalysis again. Uh, what is it for? Who is it for? At what frequency? Who can purchase it? 
do we need money? Uh, which which remains really one of the banes of of the whole experiment's existence, I think. Are you familiar with Anki Mukherjee's work on um, psychoanalysis for the common goods in Delhi and in London and in New York and the projects of post-traumatic psychoanalytic um, therapy being conducted by groups of activist analysts uh, for free? Yeah, um, and long history, but one that, you know, Elizabeth Dantos starts, you know, at okay. the very and there are there are many examples clinics on the upper you know in the upper part of manhattan i mean it has been done uh or like this quip that uh i know lots of psychoanalysts hate but you know uh guattari is saying i also think the patient should be paid what about that right there have been all of these ways to try and shift that question and you can actually imagine a different state wanting to pay the patient to be in treatment, to be ready to go back to work. That's kind of where the wellness apps of today are, where employers are like, please take your five minutes to get calm so you can come back to whatever it is. Um, but And there's, of course, the very radical tradition there um, that's been in the hands of many. Or the, there's the Green Clinic in Brooklyn now. And um, there are, you know, um, many different approaches to deleting money and keeping the relationship and seeing what happens to the relationship when money is deleted. Even Freud eventually got there. Mm -hmm. Perhaps too late. Kind of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the things that's so stunning about reading Freud's early letters to analysts um, is just how much money is the issue. Um, how, how much he keeps correcting analysts back to thinking about money when they seem to be think, you know, get, getting caught up in uh, you know, more abstract or philosophical questions. You know, how many times has Freud issued the corrective? You know, your patient needs you just to think about the money. That's all, that's, that's everything that's necessary is to think about the money. Which actually gets me to a question that, you know, I think I'd feel, um, I think it would be a missed opportunity not to have a chance to ask it and answer it. Um, even to think about it as a historical question um, or as a kind of historical problematic. You mentioned Janet Malcolm. Um, one thing that we know is psychoanalysis has a history of, it has a profoundly controversial history in the United States, especially. I mean, it has controversial histories everywhere, but one of those histories takes place here in the United States. You know, there are those who think of psychoanalysis as a normative set of regulatory fantasies designed to normalize um, male sexual violence that has roots in acts of sexual predation that we know took place. Um, I'm not necessarily talking about the seduction theory when I say that so much as thinking about um, the Dora case and the ways in which I think anyone who reads the Dora case study has to at some point confront the real horror of Freud's conduct during that treatment. Um, how, how do you think about that? How do you, how do you deal with that um, in your work? Why? Why, why do we want to keep this alive? You know, what, what, what is it about it that seems worth, you know, keep, you know, keeping afloat, keeping in the air? Yeah, I mean, this is a question of my life. So I'm, this is not gonna, you know, on the one hand, I just won't be able to be so tidy. I think that something I'm sometimes fond of saying is humans are just, we're not that creative. We don't have yet that many tools and techniques for thinking about the difference between what's been given us, and I mean in the negative sense more than in the positive sense, and how to become a subject anyway in light of it, or make use of it, or do something with it. It allows us to be, of course, there, there's, there's already the norming project right there. Allows us to be what? That's a question. Um, you know, uh, a friend of mine wrote to me just this weekend who had started the book and, and said that it was, you know, it's about a, a horrible inheritance that's also one of the only possibilities for human potential, right? Part of a kind of revolutionary, mm -hmm. but, but it is still the inheritance, right? You can't get away. I mean, 
so many radical and left people who are very invested in the psychoanalytic project. I mean, they flinch when you mention something like Dora, when one mentions something like Dora. I don't know if I flinched, I wasn't looking. <laughs> um, and so I think it's always about, you know, really sitting with those who've come before and are coming alongside and after who are able to take, for instance, that history and not look away from it. And then to say, and what next? So in the same way of psychoanalysis is supposed to be this tool that differentiates what was put into you from you, we also have to be able to look at some kind of psychoanalysis with this inheritance worked through. What can it be now and today? And whether or not I think one is, while well, still being a really rigorous clinical practice, that's the problem. It's that, that double. Um, I think I would care a lot less if it were like a major method only in my work, right? Uh, and the book is not, you know, but I am invested in in a kind of clinical future for the practice as a non non analyst uh, and maybe recipient of it. Um, so I think that's the question. And for me, the way to to excavate it is to, to be in the history, to be in what's really painful, but also to be in what was there and was radical, and not forget that either. Um, and kind of only look at what was so bad. I mean, and then of course there's the Juliet Mitchell who answered your question decades ago. Like what if, not so much in the Dora case, right? But what if it's such a good description that we can reverse engineer something else? And, you know, the last thing I'll say, I know we're supposed to go to Q and A is if I ever have had a mantra and I don't, it would be kind of this uh, idea from beyond, which is that we have to make life as life is, is yet to come. Very hard, very hard in California with the huge wildfires, very hard with the plague and everything else. Um, but we also have to make forms of care as if life is, is yet to come too. And for me, I'm not ready at all to give up on that framework of the unconscious, uh, et cetera. And it's, it's the place where it lives. That's my answer, I think, for today, August 23, 2021. <laughs> Anna, it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful answer. And, um, you know, as someone whose method of analysis is indelibly psychoanalytic, I appreciate your sort of projecting the flinch back at me. And um, I, I look forward to dwelling in that flinch with you uh, for some time to come. But thank you so much, Hannah. This thank was, you, this Greg. was an incredible conversation. I'm truly honored and moved by it. Um, and I really look forward to um, to looking at the questions. Do, do we remember whether I'm asking these questions? I think I am, right? I'm ans asking these questions on other people's behalf. Yeah, I think so. Is that, I think, and you 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 can um, you can look you can see them too, right? So I Zoe asks: As teletherapy becomes more common, especially one-on-one -on -one therapy, do you feel it would be more accessible to people with scarce resources, or will it be price gouged? like so many other services or drugs in the medical industry? Yeah, so I think that that's gonna be really complicated. Um, one of the, and that's a really great and important question. So teletherapy, as I'm, I'm like overly fond of saying, is often premised or escorted by a really democratizing um, ethos, right? The idea is if only we could batch process patients, everyone wants this. Uh, the problem is something's holding them back, typically money, um, and other things too, time, which is related to money. Grace, I love your ideas. The triad uh, is time, language, and money. Um, that's it, it's so good. Um, and sometimes that that's true, right? If you do make use of technology, you can scale. Uh, the question is, does it bring down costs? Uh, and then the second question is, if is it anything you might want or actually get something out of being in relation to. So sometimes, right, with a suicide hotline, completely free, still free, always free. Uh, we could, you know, hang up this call, and also warm lines, right? Not just crisis hotlines, but something in between where you can just talk or get referral. I was gonna mention that, yeah. I mean, it's not just mm -hmm. only, you know, really at that dire moment. And at suicide hotlines, there are plenty of exploit callers, which I'm a fan of, who just call the talk, right? They, they know the number, they just call. When, when we get over into like kind of the corporate mm -hmm. teletherapy zone, which is really on so many people's minds for all kinds of reasons, um, it might be a little cheaper, 
but also frequently it's not. It's just phrased as such. Um, what it does do is it takes care of this really difficult thing for the history of therapy, which is the referral. Who should I speak with and when? And so it, it, it puts an algorithm mm -hmm. in that place, uh, often not really successfully. Um, so I think that there are lots of different things to pay attention to in that space before just wholesale accepting there's more of it so it's cheaper, something like that. Not that, Zoe, that was the way you phrased yeah. it, but that's one way it's marketed really heavily, a lot in the New York City subway system. Yeah, no, absolutely. I know, you know, one of the things that I was thinking about here as well, I have a friend who works um, for a hotline in the UK who was telling me recently that um, they've had to work very hard to protect um, the the anonymity of the hotline workers after various forms of escalating pestering that was spilling offline that had been happening in the last few months from people who were using um, using hotlines sort of maliciously or something like that. It's, I mean, you know, it's just another question of, of anonymity. Um, a certain uh, urban historian named Jackie Shine, who might see uh, in the uh, in the questions whom I happen to admire very much, has a question about urban historiography. What can the spread of crises hotlines in the 1950s and 60s tell us about the massive demographic and spatial shifts, especially in the US, from the city to the suburb? Or put another way, does the notion of distance embedded in the hotline overlay what might otherwise be the intimacies of cities? Or slash and does it connect people at physical distance from the city to services there and places they had left? Oh, I somehow just made the questions huge and us small, but I fixed it. Thank you so much for that question. So, of course, this the telephone is becoming ever increasingly available and used precisely because of this history. And at the same time, the first two hotlines I look at in the book are urban hotlines. And so they're really about remediating that kind of urban intimacy, but at distance and anonymously. It's not to do this other work of some kinds of telemedicine and teletherapy of yoking, right, the person in the suburb back to their doctor in the city, right, which is kind of the Freud thing. Freud and his best friend are far apart. Uh, it's not dealing with that problem. But the third hotline I look at um, does because it's an evangelical hotline. And so it's used as a, and I mean that literally, like Christian mm -hmm. evangelical hotline. It's used to connect a flock and to make a flock and elaborate a flock, uh, what Erica Robles Anderson calls a, a mediated, you know, kind of congregation here. Um, but for mental health, but under the gr grounds of and under the sign of the church. And that very much is a kind of uh, suburban story uh, about that, that shift uh, from the urban density of LA to a kind of more, a larger network and a larger flock that runs very much in parallel with what's also happening in terms of American Protestantism and so forth also. Um, but, but strangely for a very long time, uh, hotlines are really contained to the urban. And it took until something like the year 2000 until we had a nationally funded national US suicide hotline. So for a very long time, it's run by activists in dense urban centers, um, the rape crisis hotline first here in the Bay Area and then in LA, right overlaid onto uh, places where these services do exist, but not in the way that people wanted to make use of them. And so, uh, yeah, but that's, a, I'll be thinking about that question. It's fantastic, thank you. It's a beautiful question. And, and as is this one, I think, um, which is a question about uh, porn lines uh, and gay and lesbian community hotlines. Um, you know, so the, the question that Quinn Anes Reese asks is, how do you think that the rise of teletherapy and crisis lines relate to the advent of other forms of distanced intimacies mediated by the telephone, such as dialogue porn lines uh, or gay and lesbian community hotlines? One could also think of, you know, Grindr and, you know, app, sex apps whose goal is some yeah. form of distanced intimacy rather than, you know, a surrogate for, um, like the monogamous normalization of sexual relations. Yeah, so I mean, I just want to refer everyone to this amazing book by Kate McKinney called Information Activism, 
which uh, deals with what happens next with the with a lesbian warm line and referral service and sort of fleshes out that history. Um, I think that you know these these are the, the dial a minute, right? They're not just the sort of sex line, but also like the psychic. Like there are many, that form comes into play increasingly after you have the very free and wide open crisis hotline. I think also because the crisis hotline was so successful in the Bay Area, um, specifically in the queer community here, uh, then what if you're not in crisis? What if it's doing something else? And so just to go back as well, um, the hotlines from Jump are not just being used as hotlines. Like I can't stress it enough. It's not just being used the way it was designed. Quote unquote, you know, there is a lot of interpretive flexibility. It's still true. I mean, people call in hotlines for sex. It's just not consensual. Whereas the example you're raising is. Um, I mean, I've I've worked on a hotline and that not a suicide hotline, but that that has been my experience. Um, and so I, I think we'd have to look at scholars of those forms to tell us exactly when and where, but that you can just see the transformation start to happen in the archives where immediately you have a hotline for mm -hmm. suicidality and people are gonna use it a different way, which is you know rich and wonderful sometimes and other times difficult for the person on the other end of the call. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean that that sounds like an understatement. What you sound what you're describing sounds potentially quite traumatizing. Um, well, I, mean, I, I, actually, I you know maybe maybe not, but it sounds like it could be. It, I think it could be. Um, one thing I was I was talking about that this morning in a in another interview. You know, so one that's one reason why people say, well, let's bring in data and let's screen calls. We can block X person's call every time. Uh, you can also do a kind of community um, self-protection by tracking these calls in analog ways that don't involve datification and don't involve sort of pseudo policing and policing incarcerality too. Um, I think shocking, mm -hmm. but also it's something one's prepared for, I'm, but I can only speak for myself. I'm sure to someone else it would exceed and yeah. well go there. But it's, it's you know- And, it's, and goodness it's, knows, I mean, Things can happen in AA meetings, which are equally, you know, shocking or even potentially or traumatizing. Classroom, or the street. Um, or... The, or a classroom. Well, you know, I wanted to ask you about the classroom because, you know, we're both teachers and it sometimes seems as though the analogy between the classroom and the clinical scene in psychoanalysis is one that, you know, so often seems to come up, even if, if only when people are trying to use psychoanalysis to justify some kind of shady or kind of, I don't know, predatory, pseudo predatory ideas about the classroom. So you can answer that if you want, but I actually have a question which is like maybe pointing in a slightly, if not a happier direction, but at least sort of like less troublesome to someone, you know, speaking of someone who has tenure, which is, um, you know, actually when I mentioned what you begin with is the, the Trump election, what you actually begin with is trans lifeline during the Trump election. Um, and, I had not put this together until that moment, but I'm wondering if Trans Lifeline is not increasingly the, the, the sort of main nodal trans political organization of, of all. And there are other LGBT organizations and there are kind of groups that do advocacy on behalf of trans community. But in terms of trans run, trans centered organizations, I, th I think that trans lifeline might be the biggest, and if so, that's kind of interesting. I don't, I don't know. What, I mean, I, I forgot to look that up before. Do you have to know if that's true? I don't, but you know, so the the trans lifeline, which uh, is is the first, I think it's the first sentence of the book or something, and it's right there. Um, yeah. One of the only hotlines in our contemporary that refuses all forms of carceral intervention as it meets the kind of psychiatry that the suicide hotline now is a kind of can be a pipeline for. Um, and so I've written about in the mm -hmm. book Trans Lifeline, but also uh, for a website called Somatosphere about how it's preserving really that true origin in the US of the suicide hotline is refusing both psychiatry and policing 
to protect its callers. And so it was really yeah. important before looking at all of the ways we've gotten away from it to look. I'm often asked this question when I do stuff with more tech oriented people, like, but who's doing it well? And that, that's like my, it's my go-to answer yeah. precisely because it, there is a constant survey of callers, you know, freely given survey. Would you stop calling if we, and the answer is always yes. Um, and mm -hmm. the, the question there is mm -hmm. if we use geolocating, if we did any kind of tracking and they just, it's been preserved that spirit and really importantly so. Um, you you don't there are no wellness checks by the police there were big air quotes around wellness yeah checks. yeah no no we we got that we got that um and i think that you know that that takes us to seven o'clock and it also uh leaves this sort of powerful anti-carceral note um and, and an opportunity for us all to reflect on how better to attack to detach um feeling from carcerality um which i think is one of the great challenges of our moment and one of the great challenges of the distance cure thank you so Anna much Zeta, um which i am everyone thank you so much for us thank you so much see you soon in person thank you um hannah thank you grace so much uh to our audience members if you would like to make a purchase of hannah's new book the distance cure you could do so by clicking on the green link on the bottom of your screen with that any last words before we close tonight hannah just thank you so much all for coming and thank you so much for hosting and i look forward to seeing you either at distance or in person soon Thank you all. Have a good evening. Take care. Bye. Bye. Grace, thank you.